So good morning, folks. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties there. Um, I don't want to take up too much of folks' time uh, trying to sort some of this out. We do want to make sure that folks are able to log on and participate, though. Um, that's an important part of the process. Um, and uh, like I indicated in the email, I'm happy to be involved with the group. Feel super awkward coming in so late in the game. Um, really appreciate the work that's been done up until this point. I hope that uh, during the conversations today, we can continue to move forward with the good work that you all have been doing. And, and um, I, I do have to ask one favor, though, because I am so new to this whole process. Is that I don't really know everyone that's involved here. So I wonder if we could just quick go around the room here and if you could just introduce yourselves um, and let me know who you're representing on the working group. Um, and like I said, my name is John Messner. I'm a commissioner with the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. I sit in the seat uh, with expertise in land use planning um, and local government. Uh, and maybe I'll just call folks as I see them on my screen and you could just introduce yourself. Let me know if you're a formal member of the group or an informal member of the group. Um, that would be helpful. So Mike. Yes, good morning, Commissioner. Mike Wardinsky. I am a regulatory engineer at Occidental Petroleum. I have lived and worked in Colorado since 2010 um, in the oil and gas industry. And uh, my impression is I am a, a formal member of the group. Okay, thanks. Brooke? Hi, John. I'm Brooke. I'm with the university group, and I've been working on the economic and environmental analysis of the uh, report. Great. Amanda? Good morning. Amanda Westwardham. I'm the Associate Director of Science and Data Division at the Colorado State Forest Service, and I am the representative of, on the group for the from the Colorado State Forest Service that was identified in the legislation. Great. Thanks, Thank Commissioner. You. Stephen? Good morning, y'all. My name is Stephen Arauza. I am a member of the CPPHE's Environmental Justice Advisory Board. I am a formal uh, member of the group, although in a non-voting capacity, and I'm here to represent the concerns of disproportionately impacted communities. Thanks, Stephen. Holly? Good morning. Um, I'm Holly Roth. I am also a part of the CSU group, um, working a lot more on the lab side of things, and then pretty much anything that Brooke didn't mention, I've been working on. So Great. Thanks. Um, Janice, I know that's you, but it says Aaron Ray on your name tag. Yeah, hi. I don't know why it says Aaron Ray, but anyway, um, Janice Hallowell, um, I am the citizen who brought this idea forward to the legislature and proposed the bill, and um, uh, I'm representing the environmental interests in the state. Thanks. Aaron? Good morning, everyone. Aaron Ray, Assistant Director for Energy in the Department of Natural Resources, not a formal member of the work group, but just here to support from DNR's perspective. Um, Ashley. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ashley Woolman. Um, I work with Amanda West Fordham at Colorado State Forest Service as a forest carbon specialist. And I think I'm an informal member, but I've been um, the author of Section 7 of the report. Great. Thank you. Carmia? Good morning. I'm Carmia Woolley with the Bureau of Land Management. Um, I am a, an informal member. I believe Kimba Anderson is the formal member of the group representing the BLM. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, Carrie? Sorry, my video. Hi, I'm Carrie. Um, I was in charge of section four of the report doing the laboratory testing. I'm also part of the CSU group. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Usama? Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Usama. I am a petroleum engineer with the Bureau of Land Management, and I am an informal member. Thank you. Uh, Trisha?
Hi, this is Trish Cartmel. I'm also an informal member representing petroleum engineering with the BLM. Okay, thank you. Matt? Uh, I'm Matt Wilkerson. I'm the Inspection Enforcement Coordinator with the BLM, another informal member representing BLM. Thanks. Great. Uh, Dylan. Good morning, Dylan Southern, Associate Director of Strategic Initiatives with the Colorado Energy Office. Um, informal member, kind of filling in today for Quinn Antis, who is a formal member. Okay. And Linda. Uh, good morning. This is Jeff Sorkin for Linda Geyser um, with the U.S. Forest Service uh, National Office. Um, and I'm going to be driving for part of this, so um, be patient with me. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for introducing yourselves. Um, I asked that for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's good to get to know all of you. Two, it's important um, that we understand who the voting members are and who the non-voting members are um, for a potential um, decision point today. Um, I, I Right off the bat here, I have a little bit of a concern because I'm not sure we have enough people to actually take action on a, a, an item today um, participating. And so um, if you know folks that are formal members that need to participate, um, I would ping them uh, and have them come participate here if we're going to take action on any particular day. Um, as we do need a quorum in order to be able to make a decision, I think. Um, but uh, I will also send out an email here in a little bit when we take a quick break and just have folks, encourage folks to participate. But it is important that we have a quorum when we're making decisions. Um, but with that, uh, I do want to take a second. And my understanding is, is that we have two decision points today. One decision point is whether we are comfortable um, with the report that has been developed uh, over the last few months um, uh, and um, kind of a thumbs up and thumbs down, whether we're comfortable with the information in the report and the conclusions in the report, or if there's any additional information that needs to be included or modified in that report. Um, and then two, based on the information provided in the report, um, whether or not we want to um, authorize CSU to develop a pilot project um, with the parameters laid out in the legislation HB 23-1069 um, and take the, the next steps or not. Um, and we'll take those one at a time and um, kind of work through those. Um, does anyone have concerns with those two decision items? Does that seem like a logical step for the meeting today? Seeing no concerns, um, I'm gonna put Holly and Brooke on the spot here. And I wonder if, I, I know that the group went through kind of line by line, um, uh, at the last meeting and kind of work through some changes or some discussions. But I wonder if, if we could take it up to a little higher level and if uh, Holly and Brooke, you guys would be willing to give a, just a general summary and conclusions on the different sections within that so that everyone's on the same page with what you all have determined your conclusions are in the different sections of the report. Um, sure. Um, let me just get it pulled up. <laughs> um, and I guess we'll just go through and do like one one or two sentences on each task, maybe, um, just share. What yeah, our I mean, each of those tasks, because those are really the decision points in there are the conclusions that are going to be utilized to decide, I think, by this group, whether or not to uh, authorize um, CSU to continue forward with the pilot project concept, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so, so, as a reminder, the uh, work was a literature review um, and we really found out there was a good potential for biochar to do all of the seven things listed within that task um, but there's quite a bit of nuance associated with it and so 
um, we did find that there's quite a bit of variability in the results. And so it's important to kind of go through and do our due diligence with whatever material we ultimately or you ultimately decide on. Um, and that's kind of what guided our experiments later on. So um, definitely some good promise, but um, it, it needs to be verified within your specific system. Um, and then should I, should I just go through all of the tasks or should I wait in between? No, I go through all the tasks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So the second task was, um, related to the federal or state laws that may apply to the project. Um, it's probably not considered a normal material within oil and well as well plugging um we hey, probably Holly, need Holly, to one, one request second. a variance i'm, I'm gonna yeah. stop you just one second i i don't know is it just me or is holly cutting it in and out maybe holly turn your screen off and that may help and then we can keep, keep okay is it is it better without the video on, maybe? You're no? still kind of okay. cutting in and out a little bit. I'm sorry. Let me try one really quickly. I can um, jump over to my task, Holly, while you're getting set up, if that sounds okay. good. That'd be yeah, good. maybe we'll just give it a second. Yeah, I worked on task six, which was assessing the cost associated with using biochar in the plugging of oil and gas well. And from my analysis, I found that using biochar with 3% in cement slurry and 15% in the spacer fluid leads to an increase in about 2% of the overall cost of a typical well with a measured depth of 6,800 feet. If we're looking at carbon credits, this would be a break even cost of $120 per carbon credit if you were able to sell that biochar for carbon credit to break even on that additional cost of using biochar in the well. Current carbon credits as of February are selling for about 150. So this is promising if the operators are eligible for carbon credits, which they are not currently, uh, but there is potential for that in the future. And then task eight, which was the life cycle assessment. I analyzed five different pyrolysis systems for producing biochar and greenhouse gas emissions without biochar were around 11 tons of CO2 equivalents per well. And depending on the pyrolysis method used, this dropped anywhere um, from 48 to 95% in emissions. So we had 48 to 95% emissions reduction, depending on which pyrolysis method was used. The stationary systems show a lot of problems along with the mobile carbonizer. And then in comparison to 2005 uh, baseline emissions, which are Colorado's greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals to be net zero by 2050. This is based on 2005 emissions levels within the oil and gas industry. If the 900 orphan wells in Colorado were plugged by 2050, it leads to about a 0.05% decrease in those emissions associated with the oil and gas industry. For the 33,000 abandoned wells in Colorado, that leads to about a 1.5% decrease in emissions from the 2005 baseline. And then Holly, I'll push it back over to you if you're ready. Um, yeah, I hope I hope this is working a little bit better. Um, I think we can hear you better, yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so um, on the regulatory side, the last thing that I really wanted to say was Janice had a question about whether or not we would need new legislation in um, I did answer that later on in the um, the summaries and conclusions. I do think if we were to apply this on a large scale, we probably would need um, to add something in because it looks like we need a variance per well, um, but I could be mistaken on that. Um, task three was, you know, we looked into a little bit of geomechanical models, um, but ultimately really just used these to guide our experimental plans. Um, we identified that pressure and temperature 
um, are two of the most two two very important variables um, for whether or not this would be successful. Um, and so I'll let Carrie kind of take over for the um, lab stuff here. I think that's probably really that and um, Ashley's section are probably the last two that we really need to go into in detail. So for task four, um, I think the main takeaway was that the three percent, like a three percent by weight mix of cement and biochar seemed to be promising, but that's only if that mix is not too viscous. It's more viscous than the control was. Um, and by lowering that viscosity even further, it totally compromised the strength of the cement. So if our 3% mix is not too viscous, it seems to perform similarly to the control in terms of strength. Um, there's some interesting things going on with its permeability and um, like interaction with certain anions like sulfate and chloride, um, which weren't totally clear. So I definitely feel like extending um, this trial, we only had time to to look at the cement in chunks of 28 days. So 28 days was like our longest time point. And I think if we were to move forward, extending that past 28 days is really important because we saw a lot of change between like seven and 28 days. So I'm curious if we'll see more changes between 28 and 52 days, for example. Um, we are also retesting, like Holly said, the heat um, component, which is really important. The first time we tried it, there was a mistake in the setup. So in the original report, that was inconclusive. We're in the process of retesting that right now, but as of right now, it's still inconclusive. Um, so I guess my summary of this section is we just need to, to test more stuff. Um, but the 3% seems like it's not making it any worse, which is good, I guess, if it's not too viscous. Holly, did I miss anything? <laughs> No, I, I I think that's sufficient for right now. Um, and then Ashley, if you could just go through real quick. Yeah, um, section seven is to determine the amount of biochar that is available for use in the state. Um, so for this analysis, we used data from the Forest Inventory and Analysis Nationwide Program um, for Colorado, and we were able to look at 40 different counties in the state, and we filtered only for non-reserved land. So that means um, no state park or no national parks or wilderness areas, just um, what would be considered accessible or um, not protected um, land. And so we looked at all different um, tree species and filtered for standing dead trees that um, are salvageable, so not too much um, rotten material. And we arrived at a total statewide estimate of 7.14 billion cubic feet of um, woody material. And so when we take that and, um, or to back up, um, most of that material is on US Forest Service land. And then the species that dominate that are Engelmann spruce and lodgepole pine. Um, which reflects a lot of the insect and disease outbreaks that we've seen in Colorado over the last um, decade or so. And we were able to also identify areas where different counties where those are highest. Um, so mostly around Route County in the Northwest region, and then around Gunnison County um, in the South Southwest region of Colorado. Um, and so we then, I think Holly and Brooke um, did some further calculations to see how much um, biochar can be produced from that 7.14 billion cubic feet of, of woody material, and they arrived at approximately um, 41 billion tons of biochar would be available. So, and feel free to add anything if I forgot anything, Brooke or Holly. Just to put that in context, uh... With my calculations, it was just over four tons of biochar that's used for well plugged. I think that kind of covers all of the sections. So, okay, great. Um, that was helpful for me. I apologize if that's uh, 
kind of repetitive. Um, I did read through the whole report, uh, found it super interesting. Um, does anyone in the group have questions about the report, the conclusions or information that was provided in the report that they would like to ask at this point? So I do have one question. Um, and maybe this was talked about at the last meeting. I'm not, I couldn't remember what the conclusion was, but Brooke, you had indicated um, a figure of 33,000 unplugged and abandoned wells in the state of Colorado. I'm wondering where that figure came from. Um, as my, cal my, my calculations based on the orphan well program and input provided by ECMC, is that the number is more like a thousand? Yes, uh, it came from um, Holly. Can you remind me of? Yeah. Um, so we um, had initially pulled that uh, number from the report by Stuart Reddick, um, and that number is not just supposed to be wells. That that number is not just wells that are currently within the Orphan Well Program. It's um, if you like go on the website and you filter for um, there, there's a couple of different um, filters that we applied. Uh, um, abandoned location, abandoned well bore completion, closed, shut in, suspended location, and temporarily abandoned. And then cross-reference production records for those that have not produced oil or gas in 12 months, which gave approximately 32,000 abandoned wells from the 122,000 in the database. I think this is where the challenge is with that is that if you if you start throwing in the filters of temporarily abandoned, that actually has a specific definition tied to it. It does not mean it does not have an operator. It does not mean that it is um, could not go back into production. It just means that um, that production on it has been suspended for a certain amount of time. And so I think when I read the report and I and I see the term abandoned, um, to, to me, that that means there is no operator to be found for that particular well, right? It's, 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 there is no one with responsibility over that well. Um, and shut in, temporarily abandoned, you know, some of these categories that have been included in that, um, at least in, in my interpretation, would not be considered abandoned. Um, but have other specific definitions associated with them, you know, within the ECMC regulatory structure, but do have operators associated with them. Does that make sense? That does. And we did update the newest version of the report to include the data from about the 1,000 properly orphaned wells. Um, we did still feel like there was value in keeping that number from the 33,000, but if there is pushback on that, we can certainly take it out of the report. So my suggestion would be, like, like the number 33,000 could include, um, you know, low producing wells, it could include temporarily abandoned, it could include shut in, um, but it needs to indicate that. I, it shouldn't be just said abandoned because that leads um, to the conclusion that there's 33,000 orphan wells in the state of Colorado. And I think that's just an inaccurate uh, number. Yeah. Um, I understand. We can add in a footnote that describes all the filters that we used to determine that and change up the way that we're, what we're calling them. We'll, we'll, we'll come up with a new term for that. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. And it's okay to have a number. I mean, to me, I mean, there are a certain number of wells that are, you know, at the lower end of their production life that, you know, may be plugged in the near future that should be contemplated in this. And that makes sense to me, but I don't think we should indicate that there, there is no operator responsible for those. You know what I mean? Um, Janice, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I agree about the distinction. Um, it would be, you know, there, there's no, I think people originally were grouping everything as needing to be a um, orphan well or abandoned well um, that we are considering here. But in reality, um, maybe that's important for how many wells are available for a pilot study. But in terms of um, efficacy for 
the study to apply to oil and gas, you know, well plugging in the future. It's, I think it's a good idea to remember that there are, you know, I don't know, over a hundred thousand wells that um, eventually will come offline. And this is just to explore a better and new way to, um, to plug them to, to, um, sequester the carbon and um it's not just for orphan wells it's for whenever whenever a well needs to be plugged eventually that's kind of what we're shooting for eventually but for just for the case you know just for the situation of the of the study it's good to know how many orphans there are but you know yeah so the distinction is I good think, i think that's a good point janice i mean your numbers are also a little off but um there's Currently, somewhere 47, 48,000 wells that are that are active and unplugged, um, or in some stage of activity uh, in the state, and you know, eventually at some point are going to need to be plugged. Some may need to yeah. be plugged in two years. Some may need to be plugged in thirty years, right? But right. eventually, they're all going to need to be plugged. And so, you know, that even utilizing that number in a calculation to determine whether or not there is benefit to using um, biochar in plugging activities could be useful. Um, if you wanted to get a more direct um, calculation on the potential impact of using biochar, you know, having low producing wells included in that or wells closer to the end of their life would give you better um, analysis of short-term impacts um, of utilizing biochar in plugging activities. But um, but I hear what you're saying. Stephen, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to toss out there that I, I think the term that, at least in my mind, can trip people up is the use of abandonment or abandoned uh, to describe these wells, I think it may be beneficial to make a distinction that you know plug in abandon is um, is the term that's used at ECMC uh, pursuant to the to the rules. Um, but I think that folks can conflate abandoned versus orphan uh, pretty easily if they aren't familiar with that. So uh, perhaps you know it would be beneficial to to stick to the term orphaned as opposed to abandoned and then uh, specify that use so that folks don't get the impression that the 33,000 wells are all orphans uh, because they're not, they just have yet to be properly p and would Fair enough. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat and I'm gonna ask, um, oh, I see that Holly has answered. But Kathleen, do you want to ask your question um, rather yeah. than type it? Because we're the the meetings are recorded, and people who read this or listen to it aren't able to read chat. Oh, good point. Never thought of that. So I was just curious if there is much methane leaking from these suspended wells. And sorry if my terminology is not precise enough. Um, and if there is some significant methane leaching uh leaking could some sort of you know plug like just biochar backfill help to reduce that and then if it needs to be reactivated the well it could be vacuumed up or something like that or is that too simplistic um so to to answer the first part yes um i did look through the methods on that paper they are all officially from the orphan well list um so they are leaking quite a bit of methane, the wells that were used in that study. Um, and for those of you who came to Stuart Riddick's talk, um, kind of one of our early meetings, um, this is the same study um, that he was able to get published. Um, so yes, they are leaking methane. Um, externally from this report, which didn't really have a mandate to look into like, um, temporary methods. Um, we have discussed that since biochar looks like it has a good potential to um, 
mitigate potentially methane and other gases that could emit from the well. We from the well we have kind of floated the idea of like some kind of like a biochar filter that could be put on, you know, placed around the wells and then potentially switched out um later on. So uh, we've thought about that. Um, we weren't able to get to that just because of all of the other required tasks in it, but it could be a cool idea to look into. So, Michelle, go ahead. Thanks. That gets to a question I was having, which is if there, if this is recommending biochar always being concrete. I've only had a chance to skim it, but if that's correct, is there a risk that there could be issues with it being used in concrete? Like you said, it it changes even in the first month of use um, and that it could, you know, do we need to name what you just said that we could possibly look at biochar filters and some other ways to implement aside from the concrete? Is that is that correct that we're saying use biochar in the con concrete um so that's that's one application that we looked into um mm -hmm. basically from our results we're seeing that it looks like it could work but if i were an operator and i were thinking about doing this i would not yet feel comfortable with the amount of testing that's been done especially on the scale um, that we've been working on um so i i do think there's probably a little bit more like an extension of this lab work that needs to be done that puts it in more of a like situation, the the conditions that would be within a well bore. Um, so I guess our answer so far is we don't, have, it's not no yet, but I don't think it's a yes yet either. And is that the, um, I, I read one of the, um, kind of summary conclusions on one of the sections, and unfortunately I didn't write down what section, but uh, one of the suggestions that I think the report made was that rig a rigorous laboratory approach would be more appropriate at this stage, and is that the the topic that we're talking about as far as the utilization of the biochar and cement? No, that would be the utilization of the biochar in the spacer fluid. In the spacer fluid, okay. Yes. I, I, this is Jason. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, Jason. I, I just want to clarify real quick, and I, my cell service has been going out in and out. I've got kids, so I've got to drop off in the morning here for camp. The use of biochar and concrete has a minimal impact in terms of environmental benefit for carbon sequestration. It's really the biochar in the base in terms of carbon sequestration. And so, you know, I, I just want to reiterate what Holly basically just said is that yeah, if you want to use in concrete, great. That's a huge effort, huge testing, but the return on investment in terms of carbon sequestration there is very minimal, right? Holly Brook, am I misrepresenting that at all? Or is that something that we've already covered in detail? I think that's the most important point that needs to be reiterated here. Thanks for that, Jason. And I guess my question to the group is, is that if this is accurate, what Jason just said, has that been captured in the report? We did include that. I did uh, include in the report that 92% of the carbon sequestration is in the spacer fluid. And I did break down those numbers in a table as well that shows the carbon sequestration in the cement as well as in the spacer fluid. Great. Well, there are other... But the point that the point that was made in terms of like the char as a filter for gases going through, that's something that we've not evaluated. And that's something that you could evaluate. But in terms of carbon sequestration potential, it's really that space or fluid where biochar represents a great opportunity. Thanks. Thanks. Do other folks have questions about the report, conclusions on the report? Um, I'm not seeing any questions. So just to kind of follow, oh, go ahead, Janice. Um, I wanted to just ask the, um, the scientists at CSU to um, 
you know, is the overall conclusion of the report that this is a beneficial thing to do for the, you know, health and well-being for the um, you know, for the um, state? Um, is it is it an overall positive response? Um, before we get into the weeds too much about you know changing this or that or uh, extending any particular um, experiment, it's just is the overall report positive? I just I guess I'd like to hear a little more about, about that. Thank. You. I'll just speak on um, what I've done. Um, it does re uh, lead to a reduction in emissions and the economic analysis, uh, it doesn't add that much of an increase to the, the cost of plugging a well. I would just want to be confident that um, within the spacer fluid, um, we do more testing on that to ensure that the mechanical integrity of the well plugging process is maintained with adding biochar into that well. And as long as that is the case, it is positive for my end. Yeah, I, I would just say... My my hesitations stem from like I just I feel like we still have a few outstanding questions that we need to answer, but so far we're not really seeing anything that's saying like whoa this is a really bad idea do not do this. <laughs> um, so yeah, mo most of it is just that I have a few things that I would like to know still that I I think would hold up um, potentially getting an operator on uh, to implement this somewhere. Yeah, kind of adding on to what Holly said, I know like with my section and the, the lab testing of the biochar cement, um, I agree with Holly where there's not, there's no huge red flags of like, this is like clearly worse, but at this point I would not feel comfortable saying like for sure adding biochar to the cement makes it a better cement. Um, I just don't think we've done enough testing in this like relatively small time window to definitively say, yes, this is a good idea to put it in cement. Okay. Janice, does that answer your question? Um, well, in terms of cement, um, I'm hearing, I'm hearing the conclusion about cement, but I would like to hear a little more about the conclusion in the spacer. I mean, I could chime in here and just, I, I'm basically going to repeat what Rook and what, whatever you just said, right? Is that there's no stage gates. There's no red flags or stop signs that says, do not do this, right? I think the answer is this represents a unique opportunity for carbon sequestration at a cost that is not ridiculous, but really there's need to better, you know, it's not like green light go. There's a couple of unanswered questions that need to be answered and that that would be probably answered through a pilot study, right? Right. Um, does that help, Janice? Well, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get clarified here is, um, is, is it indicated to move towards a pilot study, to plan a pilot study? Because that's our next task is to have CSU plan a pilot study if we think that the report is strong enough to indicate that a pilot study is needed. And a pilot study could include more lab work as well as um, a plan for in-whole experimentation. Um, if we think- Don't, if, jump, if don't jump too far ahead, Janice. I'm not trying to cut you off, but I do want to just get conclusions for the report and then have a discussion about next steps, right? And so I, I appreciate that you're getting clarity on the report, but let's not jump to uh, deliberating on whether or not um, we, we want to do a pilot project or authorize a pilot project or not because that conversation is coming but i don't want to jump the gun on it so yeah the conclusion from the report is that there are no state that you know there's no there isn't a non-starter that we've found that says this is a bad idea okay so does anyone else have questions about the report michelle yeah, I'm wondering if we could hear a little bit more about the economics, not in terms of necessarily the cost for plugging the wells, but do we know about if this is creating an opportunity for biochar producers and at, at what kind of scale we might be talking about?
Are you talking specifically in terms of carbon credits or just uh, operation for biochar producers? Yeah, I'm thinking more about the production. Okay. I did not do any research on like uh, how much biochar now is, what their production capacity is per year, or how much they're selling. I know per well, it's uh, 4.2 tons of biochar would be used for an average well across Colorado. Um, so just some quick calculations. I can figure out how much that is, but that would be, we have 900 wells in the state. So that's uh, just under 4,000 tons of biochar. Thank you. Did, yeah. Sure. Any other questions on the report or the conclusions of the report? Do folks feel like their voices are heard um, and are contained within the report? Is there anyone that has concerns with uh, adopting the report with the modifications we talked about today uh, around how the 33,000 wells are classified within the report? Seeing no one raise their hand or um, have any concerns, um, I think it's fair to say that the report is accepted by this group and um, appreciate all the work that's been done. I know that it was a lot. And uh, yeah, congratulations. Mission accomplished. Um, so next step is to make a determination um, and give me a second, I'm pulling up the, the bill itself so that I get this correct, but um, you know, HB 23, 1069 asked this group um, after determining, um, after the development of this report that we just approved, that if based on the report, the work group determines that a pilot program to study the use of biochar and the plugging of oil and gas wells would have a positive impact on the health, safety, welfare of the state and would be consistent with the state's short-term and long-term greenhouse gas and pollution reduction goals as set forth in section 257102G, the work group shall no later than August 1st, 2024, direct the university to make recommendations regarding the development of the pilot program. The legislation then goes on to create very specific um, things that the university would need to do to be included in this recommendation uh, regarding a potential pilot project. The legislation doesn't authorize this group to direct what the pilot project is going to be or what the pilot program is going to be but it does ask us to make a recommendation um, as to whether or not to green light the university to develop a concept around a pilot project whatever that may be based on the findings and conclusions uh, incorporated in the report so what my ask would be um, of the group would be to have a discussion on whether or not um, to uh, approve the university being able to move forward with developing a concept uh, around a pilot project, incorporating all the elements um, associated in the legislation. Um, and I'm happy to go through those different elements, but those would really be the university's responsibility to meet the parameters of the legislation in developing a pilot project concept, whether that's in the lab or whether that's in the field, I think that that concept has to be based on the results and conclusions of the report itself. Um, does anyone have any concerns with that approach or a discussion? Uh, happy to hear folks' thoughts on that approach towards the next decision-making item. Does anyone from the university have any concerns with that concept or approach?
Um, I, I don't think so. Um, not necessarily sure like what my role is here now for the rest of the meeting. Um, but I'm happy to stay on if I need to, or if this is something that should be deliberated without us, that's fine too. Well, you guys are welcome to participate. So my understanding is, and I think this is something that we have to sort out here, but my understanding is, is that we have voting members who are Dave Andrews, who is not present. We have Jenna um, Channel. Is Jenna with us? Not present. Michael Turner. I don't see Michael Turner. Paul Osborne. I don't see Paul Osborne. Janice is here. Kathleen is here. And Karen. Um, I am replacing Karen. And so um, Mike, go ahead and ask your question. Um Paul Osborne has never been on any of these meetings. My impression was that I was the oil and gas rep and, and Paul Osborne was the PNA rep with meth methane mitigation experience. So I'm curious where the official list of voting members can be found. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question, Mike. Um, I'm curious about that as well. Um, I will try to find that. Um, John, it's in the bill. Well, it's in the bill, but- And it's bill, also on the website. All, all of these have the ability to be able to be changed based on different appointments by the different directors that are included in the bill. And it sounds like that's already happened a couple of times. Um, now, again, I'm, I'm coming in here at the last minute, and so I'm not trying to cause any problems, but I think if we are actually voting on something based on it, hey folks, if rather than text or uh, putting stuff in the chat, if you would raise your hand and just ask the question, that would be great because then I can keep track of it, and then it's also recorded so that folks listening to the recording can hear what's happening. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that has to be figured out because we do need to have a quorum in order to be able to make a decision. And currently, even even with Mike, if we had Mike as the seat, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. I'm not sure that even gives the support. Um, so what I'm gonna do is with folks, um, Grace here, if I could get five minutes and I'm gonna make a couple of phone calls here and try to sort this out. So if we could take a break until nine o'clock and then come back, I'm gonna try to sort this out so that we can make a decision here today and uh, move on to next steps. So um, everyone bear with me. I'm gonna try to sort this out and then go from there. Thank you. So um, there has been no changes in the composition of the voting members of the group, except for myself replacing Karen. Um, so right now we have, um, sorry, one second, I got it. And I've got a document here that has everything, but I'm just trying to sort it out. So bear with me one second. So we have myself, we have Kathleen Draper, we have Janice Hallowell, we've got Paul Osborne, we've got Michael Turner, we've got Jenna Channel, and we've got Dave Andrews. Those are the voting seats. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight folks. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven for voting. 
right now in uh in the meeting we've got myself we've got kathleen we've got janice and so i'm um, uh, unfortunately, at this point, we can't take any action on the items as we don't have a quorum. And Mike, I hear that you thought that you had shifted to that seat. I'm not sure that that was ever formally done. My understanding is that Paul Osborne has also never shown up to a meeting, and I hear that. And so, um, you know, we can work with um, the director of ECMC, Julie Murphy to get you appointed, but I can't do that right now. I don't have the authority for the legislation to be able to change the, the seats. And so it would be under the director's discretion. And it seems like if you've been participating in the meeting, it would make a lot of sense to me to have you participating in this um, and be a voting member, um, but I can't do that right now. And unfortunately we don't have uh, a quorum to be able to make a decision on next steps. And so, um, so my suggestion is um, that we end the meeting today. We've approved the report as it's been developed and I can send out an invite for a meeting in the next week or so um, to get together and make a decision on the next steps based on the report and based on the legislation that I lined out for this meeting. So I don't mean to waste folks time but I don't think it's um, legal for us to make a decision without a quorum. Does anyone have any questions or concerns about that? Go ahead, Kathleen. Are you able to do a mail vote or not? Email vote? That's a good question. I actually have to ask the uh, assistant attorney general on that because i'm not sure whether that's appropriate or not it's a good question though so i can ask that question and um and uh let folks know uh when i sent an email recently i saw a lot of people are out of town um yeah. the beginning of july so it might just need to be a few weeks when people are back in town and we don't have to make this decision as per the legislation until August 1st. So it's not like there's a time crunch associated with this. And so um, Janice, your hands raised, go ahead. Thank you. I'm wondering what what next steps you're talking about? Because wasn't the, wasn't the report just um, approved? That's correct. We, we said that we're good with the report. The next step would be the August 1st deliverable, which is whether or not to um, to authorize CSU to develop a concept for a pilot project as laid out in the legislation. Hmm. It's a little, um, it's not very clear in the legislation, but it, it sounds to me like in the legislation, it's saying that now the ball goes to CSU to make recommendations to us about what they want to do for their plan. So the recommendations pursuant to subsection 4B must include recommendations regarding a plan to, and then they list what's in the, what's in the plan, you know, needs to be in the plan. Um, so. Um, so that's not the yes. way. I read it, um, and and we can certainly have a discussion about it. But um, mm -hmm. the reading that I have is that our August first deliverable is, and I, and I, and this is what I read at the beginning of the meeting that if based on the report, the work group determines that a pilot program to study the use of biochar and the plugging of oil and gas wells would have a positive impact on the health, safety, and welfare of the state and would be consistent with the state's short-term and long-term greenhouse gas and pollution reduction goals as set forth in section 257.102.2G, the work group shall no later than August 1st, 2024, direct the university to make recommendations regarding the development of the pilot program. And so my reading of that is, is that we have a decision point due by August 1st as to whether or not to direct the university to develop a concept for a pilot project. Well, 
I'm sorry, but I have to dissent here. Um, that section reads that if, if we find the report satisfies those that, um, conditions that, of health, please don't interrupt me. Please no, ask, just, please let not, me speak. Uh, okay, um, I, you didn't want me to speak in the chat, so don't interrupt. Janice, I will not interrupt you. I apologize for that. Thank you. It takes me a little while to get it out. I'm I'm not a pub speaker, and I'm, you know, so it just takes me a little while to get it out. I'm trying to stay true to this bill. Um, if it's going to have a positive impact on that's consistent with the state's no that on the health, safety, and welfare of the state, and would be consistent with the state's short-term and long-term greenhouse gas blah blah blah. So if we find that it is positive, which we just did then no later than August 1st, we need to direct the university to make recommendations. So I don't see where there's a vote in there because we just did find that it's positive. So then by August 1st, we have to tell the university to make recommendations about a pilot program. That's the way I read the bill. So there is a vote in there. The vote is whether or not to direct the university. What my understanding of what, at least what I was hoping to get is whether there was any additions or any conclusions that needed to be changed associated with the report. To me, that didn't require a vote, a formal vote. It was just whether people were comfortable with the report or not. And at this point, if you want to push it and create a formal vote, then we actually have to take a formal vote as to whether or not we feel like the report is complete which would require a quorum. And then utilizing your um, interpretation of that, once we took a formal vote on the conclusions associated with the report, then it would automatically direct us to um, direct the university to develop a pilot project. Either way, there needs to be a quorum in order for a vote to be taken. Do you have concerns with that, Janice? No, I no, I don't. I um, I guess then um, the decision that was just made to move to you know when you said congratulations the the report has been approved so so maybe that isn't uh, maybe that was um, premature if we need to vote on that. Well, I actually don't think we need to vote on it. My question was really does the, everything are all the voices captured? in the report and does people feel comfortable with the report because we're going to utilize the report to make a determination on the next decision point which is whether or not that the report based on the findings of the report to direct the university to um, develop the concepts around the pilot project and so you're getting lost in semantics here a little bit but either way there's going to have to be a vote michelle you might have just answered, but I was not seeing in here that it was that we need a vote. And either even if we do, can we, you know, we have the university on online here. Do we want to let them know that we do want to see some recommendations regarding the development of the pilot program? Or do you feel that we have to vote in order for them to start making those recommendations? Because it does say the working group shall direct the university, but it doesn't say anything about um taking a vote to do that and if well because there's because the legislation developed voting members and non-voting members and because the direct is an action item which means that this working group actually has to make a decision and as it's possible that there's dissenting opinions i don't know what folks thoughts are and there has to be a clear direction given and it can't be a minority of the group that gives it that direction. Does that make sense? And so in that sense, it would have to be a vote to move forward with a with a the pilot project or not, but we don't have enough voting members to to make that decision today. Janice. 
I'm sorry, I left my hand up on finished speaking. Okay. Okay, well, does anyone else have any concerns with this? And I'm not trying, I mean, I wish we could make this decision today, but legally, I'm not sure that we have the ability to do that. And so, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to conclude the meeting today and then take um, a chance to reach out to everyone that wasn't able to make it today and um, make sure that we get a meeting that has a quorum scheduled and sometime after the 4th of July and then uh, get back together and make a decision whether to, based on the information provided in the report, direct uh, the university to take the next steps uh, around a pilot project or not. And so um, any other questions? Great. Well, thanks for your time today, and I'll be reaching out uh, as far as next steps go. So thank you.